So the title of our discussion is called The State Doesn't Care About Us. Uh, and the reason it has a star is because of our next slide, which uh, is about our agreements for this discussion. And one of our first agreements is speaking from the I or defining the we or the you. Um, so when we say the us, we're actually only talking about the us two of two, us because we don't actually know you. And you might not, you might think that the state doesn't also care about you, and then you can be an us with us, but we don't want to presume. Second. Here we go. Yeah, so um, everyone's really excited, and everyone likes to talk, maybe, some of you, whoever joins us, everyone. But basically, it would be really nice if when people spoke that uh, anyone who was interested in also speaking would wait for the person currently speaking to finish their full thought. Um, and then three, step up, step back. If you've been talking a lot, maybe leave space for other people to communicate. If you haven't been talking at all, maybe take a risk and throw your voice into the room. You might say something that really lights a spark, has a change reaction, and we bring capitalism down in this room. Also, our friendly MC will be walking around with the mic. I'm going to actually just invite y'all to pass it to the next person. Even better. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> And number four was don't be a bag of dicks, but we thought that was a little strong, so it's be kind. Be kind. <laughs> right. Sweet. Um, also, uh, so Ashok is going to be, oh, you don't have a name. He's going to be <laughs> facilitating, and I'm going to be over here with the whiteboard, so if at any point there's something that you think we should add to whatever is going on on the slide, um, or like based on what you say, I'll just be adding that. So one of the conceptions that we want to start with is the notion of humans as the original mesh networks. And what we mean by that is uh, the relationship of humans has predated any of the technology that we built to facilitate those relationships. And so if we are not recentering or understanding those human relationships as we are scaffolding technological systems, what are we actually in service of is the question. Uh, and so this notion of, one, not only recentering the notion of humanity in the technological systems that we're building so that the tech is in service of humanity, but also recentering humanity in the broader ecosystem that we are a part of and trying to nurture and sustain but are currently in the process of devastating. So the, uh, the question we have all for you, and you might want to throw in some things, is is there a point in supporting mesh networks if we aren't supporting human and ecological networks? And mesh networking as a concept of mesh networking for the sake of mesh networks or the commons for the sake of commons. And so the questions that we actually have for you is, why do you even do this? What brings you to this realm? So can you define ecosystem? Because there are a whole bunch of like Touché. environmental, cultural, and so on, right? Fantastic. So I think in this, uh, I think the biophysical geographical ecosystem, um, the fundamental resources on which our society is dependent, and the relationships in there within those kind of like um, those geographies is how I would define it in this specific case. Broadly. So, can I answer your question in that context? Yeah. So in theory, a mesh network consumes less resources than other types of networks. Tight. Anyone else want to speak to why? Um. And you're asking uh, somebody who doesn't know so just enough Just repeat about for the live stream. The question was to yeah. explain why there's uh, the notion that mesh networking would use less energy. Yeah, so my guess would be um, you're sharing hardware. Um, so you're using less physical resources. Um, you're probably using maybe less electricity. I'm not sure. Um, so, so those are my two guesses.
Anyone else? Why do you mesh? Why are you here? I feel like I've talked too much this weekend, so I'm only going to answer once, but I want to keep the thing going. Uh, I think uh, I'm, I kind of came to the, uh, I found a natural resonance with technological stuff. It sort of feels like a good place for me, but then at the same time, there are, as you're learning these things, there are aspects that just don't sit right with your view of the world. And so I think I come to mesh from that through this sort of like intersection of values and uh, understanding of something. Can I, can I write that as ideology and culture? Sure. Also, simply put, mesh networks sort of reflect the kind of world I would like to live in. Hmm. Can you say more about that? The topology, the way it's laid out, rather than having a hub and spoke way of making decisions, we democratically decide the world we want to live in. Hmm. So for me, it's more of a DIY inspiration. You know, the idea that uh, something that I use all the time is not something that I can fix or change or improve is, uh, is very disturbing. Um, you know, if I have, you know, something's in my possession and it breaks or if I want to communicate with somebody, communicate with a friend, um, I would like to be able to do that myself, independent of what anybody else wants me to do. Because... I don't really care what they want me to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I hear these kind of thematics of access and governance coming up. Um, so I think the real mesh network is the friends we make along the way. And I'm here for the people in the community. Sick. <laughs> Love. <laughs> My kind of person. down in the nosebleeds. Um, there's this discourse around data and the tech giants, which is framed along the lines of data as exhaust or as capital versus data as labor. And if you treat data as labor, then bandwidth and infrastructure is certainly a means of production. And yeah, <laughs> marks. And those should be owned by well, us framing the us as more as you mm. <laughs> Right. Who's the us? <laughs> Why can't I sit over here? Well, you're also nice. <laughs> um, I guess riffing off of that, just more generally, building essential infrastructure that's owned and operated by the people that use it and in turn fucking over the corporations that are trying to fuck us over. Um, and to what some of the other folks were saying, I think you in that corner, I can't see who that is, but uh, the, the community that's here and the larger like global community of community network hackers and enthusiasts is just, that, that's the kind of communities I think we should be supporting international communities based on sharing ideas, collaborating openly, and uh, just working together. Um, and uh, I had a third one, but it's good enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm right. running out of whiteboard space. Do you want to keep going? Yeah, we'll keep going. So something that I want to riff off of and what you said and what came together on this notion of conceptualizing the community as participants that we interact with, this notion of access and governance to our systems, being in control of our data, fucking over the corporations, um, all speaks to this notion of kind of creating or envisioning a future that we don't actually currently inhabit, right? Um, there is a optimism of mesh networks as an approach to the creation of something which does not exist. Well, do people agree with that? Is that vibey? Are people like, no. Um, we got some wavies, we got some I'm not sure. Maybe we say it a different way. Maybe the topic on the screen doesn't actually match what I just said. Right. Um. <laughs>
Well, this was actually a, we, we talked about this one. It was originally a post-monetary future, um, but that can be hard to get away from because, I mean, I know all I've ever known is a, is a society in which I needed money to do things. Um, so we kind of pushed it towards like the post-scarcity future. Right. And but I guess at this point, so does everyone know what we mean by, I guess we should articulate what yes. we mean by when we say the commons. So when we talk about the commons, we talk about the commons as a third space. It is the not, so you have two main spaces in society. Uh, now you have the public, um, which is a misnomer because it's controlled by the state. And if you are an undesirable to the state, then you are fucked. Uh, and then there's private, which if you've ever tried to use a bathroom without paying for it in the context of a major city's downtown uh, and look a certain way, you will understand exclusion in the context of the private. Um, and the third space is the conceptualization of the commons, which is the idea that you have equal access uh, and stewardship for uh, access to resources and services and goods. Uh, and so... And it's not necessarily like a physical space, though it's easy to... To see for us right. to see the commons as something like that, as a especially space. especially with in in the context of like mesh networks as commons is like not they're not necessarily physical spaces because they're they're channels that you can't necessarily put your body inside. But I don't know, it, it gets abstract pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, so that's what we mean by commons. And so this question of like what does it actually mean for a community to own their own infrastructure, specifically their own internet infrastructure? And is rebuilding in this way a gateway towards separating ourselves from state or corporate systems, or are we just re-engendering our new kind of exclusionary um, institutions? Um, and so I guess the question is, what makes a mesh network uh, a political act? Or conversely, what makes it apolitical, and does such a thing exist? Thoughts? <laughs> We got some, we got some hands. All right, I'm gonna. So we were actually having, uh, and I forget exactly with who, uh, but we were having a shade of this discussion uh, last night. Um, and sort of the question was, so let's say you have a wireless ISP, which is a purely for-profit enterprise. It's one guy who's running around hooking people up, making his own internet service provider. Um, and. Uh, People would call that not necessarily a like community act. You know, that would be a business. Um, and at the same time, you can have the same network uh, with uh, where like, okay, so now there's been some big nonprofit donation and they're providing internet for free. Is that a political act yet? And then suddenly they're linking people together a little bit more. Is that a political act yet? Okay, now, now, 10% of the nodes own their own hardware. Are we at a political act? You know, how far, so where is the line was sort of the argument. And we never came to a real conclusion, but it was a very interesting discussion about what is the line between a, uh, the line between a community network and a wireless ISP that's run by a volunteer group and just a wireless ISP that's a business. And it gets very fuzzy depending on where you end up. And my personal feelings on it is that uh, is that even as a apolitical uh, small business, wireless ISPs are still better than enormous corporate ISPs. There's one back there. Um, <clears throat> I was just thinking it, making mesh networks is definitely political. Uh, in the context of, like, if, if you're in a capitalist economic system, because in capitalism, you know, any any corp, any entity uh, that's profit-seeking tends towards monopoly. Uh, they always trend towards monopoly because conglomeration of resources uh, is more efficient and translates into uh, conglomeration of power. So, you know, by creating a mesh network and offloading all of our dependence on those monopolies, we take power from them uh, and, and return it to the hands of regular people. So I'd say definitely political. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just want to add that um, uh, uh, sort of culture has been, uh, you know, dominated by sort of male, the concept of male culture, just to make a 
broad generalization. But the thing is, there's a sort of geek culture, which I think is present here today, which is really a culture of sharing. And um, uh, there's not a, a lot of broad general discussion about that we're going to have a sharing culture. Like, and, and I think that uh, every person in this room and outside of this room who has contributed something for other people to use um, is uh, contributing to a, a sharing economy. And uh, there's a lot of spirit here for that. And uh, we should be doing this as much as possible because there's tons of things we would love to give away that, uh, and not sell and, and, uh, and to help everyone. This, because other people help us. Anyone else? So uh, one thing that I uh, definitely wanted to kind of highlight in the concept of, of the commons and as we build potentially non-monetary futures um, is that in my own life, like my dependence on money is dependent on my need to access the uh, mechanisms of my survival, whether they be food, housing, water, energy, internet, et cetera. And so is it possible that we can build the infrastructure to sustain those things, um, requiring a, a significant like in, independence from money in a way that will allow us to conceptualize new ways of value and new ways of being? Uh, and that's kind of the underlying question that uh, I think we're trying to articulate in this context. And one of our, so before we go to the next slide, one of our, like us, our guiding thoughts at this point is to experiment with mesh networks and see if create like in a way offloading from a monetary uh, system I guess in one type of infrastructure can that be like a can that be a trigger point to then offload other infrastructures mm -hmm. which is like super out there but maybe but I mean it's like the mechanism of using like surplus capital to sink into social infrastructure uh, and creating that loop so that we are getting rid of excess capital and using all of that excess capital to basically build the means of our survival uh, over time. Oh, we, got a, we got a hand. Can I uh, add an example that really resonates with me related to this? Um, there's a, a group of feminists geographers J.K. Gibson Graham, who prof they wrote a book called Take Back the Economy, which is kind of about disentangling financialization and monetization from the economy, but profile an example of what uh, you two just were talking about, of creating this sink that became where everything was sunk into that eventually ended up spinning up other projects. So initially it was a way to buy a tile factory for workers mm -hmm. to continue to have jobs that turned into a bank that turned into social enterprise support for locals in the community. And I want that for other types of infrastructure, not so just tile factories. Right? I think it was in Spain and I want to say um, Catalonia, but it might have been Basque region. Good. It's always Catalonia. Mondrian, someone else said it. Mondrian, and that is in? Spain. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, Mondrian cooperatives. If you haven't heard, Google it or DuckDuckGo it, sorry. Um, Wait, we got one more. One more question, sorry. So, so one of the things that I guess I'm concerned about over the past couple of days is we've seen like a pattern like, so how many people know about the Toronto Freenet? Counter yeah, what? Okay. Toronto Freenet? Oh. Okay. Toronto. So it used to be the biggest ISP in Toronto, right? Completely owned, nonprofit, um, thousands and thousands of users. Now it's like the smallest ISP in Toronto. Still nonprofit, still community owned. Still volunteer, right? So because the corporate ISPs can just crush them with economies of scale, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I see a pattern not just in the technology sphere, but you know, zip cars and other spheres as well, right? So it's, it's one of the concerns I'm kind of, I've seen this pattern happen before. The community builds something and then the corporations take it over, right? That's a good point. How do we insulate what we're building from corporate power? 
or the power of people who want to destroy us. Like, what if uh, you know an alt right army was like, "Fuck these mesh networks, peoples! I'm going to take down all their nodes." Like, what would be our strategy? Sounds political. <laughs> um, I have a, a just kind of a response to what you were saying, and maybe a question. Um, I joined a food co-op recently, which is a community-owned grocery store. And the thing about food co-ops is that they're more expensive than going to like your regular food basics. Um, and I think a lot of what we're talking about is how these networks have to be free. Is it possible to create community networks that are sustained by their members where they pay more than they would for like a right. Comcast? Well, uh, so I, let, let me pass this on, but um, it, it's not just an economy of scale. It's that uh, with enough capital, you like don't need to, um, you don't need to turn a profit, right? Like you need capital to give something away for free. But I'm gonna let go of this mic. Interesting thoughts swirling. I like this. I didn't mean to hog the mic. Um, it's just I've had this idea. Uh, so. The issue with the way networks are designed now is that in theory, it's the optimal way to design a network is to bury one cable, to have you know, very unresilient infrastructure that is buried underground so that you never have to maintain it or look at it again. And then one organization controls it so you can in theory have like the dictatorship, perfect allocation of resources that never actually happens. Um, but uh, technology doesn't actually work that way. It gets updated fairly frequently. Um, and burying it like a sewer pipe that's going to last for 50 years doesn't really work very well. And uh, it's, it's really a way for the large ISPs to deal with one organization, the government, as opposed to lots of people, because that becomes complicated. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to deal with that sort of community thing. They'd rather have one organization that gives them a permit to dig. Um, and I don't think that's actually the most efficient way to provide infrastructure. Because obviously, if you wanted to run fiber to this neighborhood, well, I presume there already is because it's a major city. But if you want to run fiber to a neighborhood, you're talking about a lot of work versus setting up antennas that's actually less resource intensive when it comes time to swap them out, even if it's less uh, conceptually optimal uh, if you were building a network that you plan to use forever, which doesn't really happen with technology. I don't know, that just, to me, it sounds like I'm, I'm conceptualizing like this interaction between the, this corporate ISP and the government and this tech as like a, it, it's like using, I, I just imagine it as a lot of buzzwords and tech surrounding like this RFP to a government in a way where it's like, we are the subject matter experts, so don't question us, and this is the proper way to do this. Um, I don't know. Mm. Using like tech literacy and language as power for oppression. We should probably keep moving. OK. So one thing that comes up when we think about this uh, in terms of building the commons and speaks to your point about Toronto mesh or Toronto net being taken over and the food co-op being more expensive is there's certain economic realities uh, in all of our networks, right? And so whether that be the lack of capital or the need for surplus capital, that is still um, still kind of a real, a real consideration. Uh, and so if we have economic realities of necessary capital and capital as a nece necessity at the same time, like how do we balance that to actually construct something outside of the logic of capital? Like, is that even fucking possible? Um, and, uh, and so if we have things like mesh networking and internet infrastructure that eventually requires people to pay, isn't, the, uh, isn't this kind of creating the same existing barriers, but maybe at a different level? So if you're, you don't have to be four feet tall to ride the ride, now you can be three feet tall, um, but like it's, you still, there's still that like barrier to entry. Uh, and so how do we relate to these barriers that we're constructing to entry um, over time in the context of what we're actually building? Uh, and is it even something that we think about? Um, and so it's like, where can we uh, compromise on funding uh, 
in order to be in service to this, whether it be donations of you know space and time, uh, like Mozilla potentially gave. Do they donate? Yes. Um, <laughs> checking. Um, and so this question of like, where have you seen the most effective interventions of transitioning to from fiat capital or these pools of surplus to actually community capital and stewardship? Back there. Thanks. Um, can I ask the question of like, maybe not seeing it as a barrier, but a question of uh, the community having uh, respect and a, um, I'm lacking the bright term for it. Can you define the community? Well. That's the that, that's the, that's the that's the that's the actually broader question of like who's this actually for? But like, so I'm I'm using the community as a stand-in right now f to get to a broader point of like we can see something as a barrier in terms of financial, but then also not putting no cost on it means that the 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 community and I'm trying not to use the consumer as the as the, as the to change the ter terminology, um, you know, not seeing any value in the service. Mm. It's not like the two go hand in the two don't go hand in hand, but there is something to be said where where there is, when there is value placed upon what is being provided or what's being offered or what's available, but what that value and how that value is shown can move beyond just money. But like what like that's a big. I see what you're saying. I actually want to skip a question now. You want to what? Skip a question, the one about the, uh, the participation one, because okay. it's like cogent to this. But let's see if we have anything else here first. It's like you were in the room when we were making this presentation. <laughs> OK. Like, on point. Anybody else? So you're asking about ex examples. <laughs> Wearing a Food Not Bombs t-shirt today, so it's on point. Um, and, you know, one example of, uh, you know, just repurposing what would otherwise be like the excess of capitalist society, um, food that would otherwise go to waste, and volunteer run, like freely giving that away, cooking it up, and done purely out of love. Um, and, um, and one of the main projects I've been working on over the past five years is a, a space in Oakland called Omni Commons, which is a collective of collectives and run by consensus. And we're only able to <laughs> purchase the building uh, two years ago uh, thanks to an anonymous angel who donated a million dollars and lent us a million dollars. Um, and <laughs> so it's not necessarily like, you know, uh, we were hoping to create a very replicable model, but this is just a miracle that sort of happened. And also, uh, we probably would have otherwise sunk under just the enormous costs of rent and uh, you know, other utilities that we use. But uh, um, by and large, uh, owning spaces or taking them over, and you see many more examples of this, and, in Spain or uh, in Germany, Berlin has a, a large squatting community and pushing for uh, adverse possession laws and or occupations, that sort of thing. But taking back space, I think, is a, is a good start. I think otherwise food is pretty easy to solve. Um, and, you know, with these technologies, uh, internet access and donated bandwidth, so that's the other thing with People's Open. We have offers of gigabits of donated bandwidth from the Internet Archive um, and Paxio, uh, a local ISP downtown. So working with those organizations, I, I don't think you can really make like a, a hard line as to what is you know uh, the ideal. Like so, Paxio is a for-profit ISP, but they can also do good and they can give to the commons. They can share a portion of that surplus and get to the commons, and I think that's how we make that transition, but sorry, that was a bit long. <laughs> okay. 
times flat circle. That's really better. <laughs> Yeah, I want to bit on that as well a little bit. Um, the upstream's internet provider, uh, the internet provider is providing upstream to, to Freifunk in Berlin at least, and, uh, and also in some other parts of Germany, also mostly for profit. And that's, um, yeah, it's hard to draw the line there. And it's, on the one hand, they're corporations for profit, and they have certain uh, inherent needs. But on the other hand, they're also run by human beings that are mm. geeks and interested in networking. Right. Um, also part of the community. Also part of the community, exactly. <laughs> and um, yeah, another thing is in about um, yeah taking excess capital and making it uh, putting it into the commons. Another example for that is okay, long German word, Mietshäuser Syndikat. <laughs> it's a an organization in Germany that supports uh, housing projects that want to acquire the house and the land it stands on. And they started at the end of the 80s, came out of the squatting movement, and it's about 200 houses by now. Um, so they have a lot of experience dealing with banks, dealing with, well, dealing with everything that's involved in, 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 in house ownership. And the way they set up this, these cooperatives uh, for each house is they're structured in a way that these houses and the land they're on are taken away from the market permanently and can never be can never be returned and um, that's pretty interesting um, because that's, that's a form of resilience right when you when you talk about resilience in, in the context of mesh networks it's mostly uh, a technical function like what happens when I when I take a node away or when a node goes down and, um, and there's this quote that the internet routes around failure um, but resilience is, has a lot more layers to it mm -hmm. um, the ability to you, you were speaking about uh, uh, hyperbolic military uh, attacking mesh networks or something like that earlier, and like resilience is also the ability to adapt to change, um, to changing to a changing economy, changing environments, changing needs by users. Um, and, yeah. Cool. So there's one question. Thank you. Um, is this question, uh, is the idea of participation towards nourishment, right? So it's like, how do we build the capacity for our participation to build towards our sustenance? So the fact that we're like shopping at a food co-op re-engenders or expands the ability of that food co-op to serve or provide, or like being a part of a, a land trust is what we call it in English. Um, and to, to be able, or a permanent housing cooperative that is able to extend and provide more housing over time. Or the fact that we're like working for a mesh network, uh, working on a mesh network, and it provides more internet access over time. And right now in our society, we don't really have that. We have like the best that capitalism does uh, or tries to do is the form of conscious consumerism. Uh, and so it's minimizing the effect of your participation, not really scaffolding your participation towards building something else. Uh, and so one of the things that I think it can end up a problem in this context is, um, is how, do we, how do we value contributions in ways that aren't necessarily monetarily defined, right? Because if, if everyone's participation is still valued in money, are we not just like wage slaving again for like mm -hmm. a good business? Um, but also really having to account for notions of like, yeah, like if this person has been giving all, their all, like should they get some form of reputation or understanding about them giving their all and making really good contributions over time? Um, and and I then, think about, oh, yeah, and then yeah. adding to that based on the, sorry, I'm breaking yeah. our own rule. It's all no, good. I mean, adding to that, the comment, I forget who said it, about how if you give people something for free, they won't value it. Um, right. That is super real. Um, and then I like take that and I connect it to what we've heard about people who give their all and volunteer um, with mesh networks or community networks and end up burned out. And in a way, it's unfortunate because in that, in that relationship, someone is working so hard and putting so much effort and value providing someone with, I mean, I think I would a little bit disagree on like people don't value things that are free. Um, but that's like an ideological question that's beside the point. Um, like if, if like we could change the structure, we could change the structure of that relationship so it would, so the 
in a way, like the person who is receiving this internet is maybe not paying money, but paying something else that is like, that translates to this, this effort that a volunteer worker, right. owner, whoever, whatever you wanna name that role is putting in. Um, and just like kind of shifting how we think about payment for goods and services in like a way that's more human centered and less corporate or organization centered. Exactly. Just to... And like riffing off that, I think the, um, yeah, like how do we, so one thing I used to work on is a multi-stakeholder energy cooperative. Uh, and what that meant was that people would invest money and they would get paid back, but they wouldn't have any say. So that was one of the stakeholders. The workers would provide sweat equity. And so we would gain ownership or a piece of ownership or stake of the system over time by contributing our labor. And then the consumers of the energy itself would also get, um, get stake over time. Right? And so as they were paying their bill and paying into the system, their contributions would be seen. Um, and so I think about, yeah, what are the ways, what are the other ways that we can, we can value or show um, contributions in a way that the person who's getting it for free, per se, could actually be like, oh, this is something that I'm actually a part of in building. Um, and these are like technologies that I think are definitely emerging. Um, so let's see. So one of the things that this gets to is this notion of like coordination and coordination pains of decentralized networks. Um, how many people of here have volunteered at some sort of organization? How many people, keep your hands up. How many people have, if you haven't experienced a coordination problem in that volunteer experience, please put your hand down. I asked that wrong. If you have not, put your hand down. So if you have, keep your hand up. Problems off. Problems yeah, up. Yeah, problems, keep your hands up. Sorry, so, sorry. Yeah, I think that was a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Wow, that got meta. Um, for the live stream, in case okay. you can't see, the majority of the hands stayed up. Did anyone put their hand down? Has anyone, okay, I'll ask the question the other way. Has anyone ever like has been part of a volunteer organizational experience and not had a coordination problem? Put your hand up. What are these things? Tell us more. <laughs> yeah. What was it? What context was it? It was a huge protest. Yeah. Anger. Anger keeps people coordinated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. And focus. 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 Laser not focus. Anger. You need a common enemy. Laser focus. And mine was a volunteer summer camp. Okay. It was a bunch of very experienced people. Ah. It was a summer camp. Okay. So we got a summer camp and a protest, which are kind of the same thing. Very similar. <laughs> Lots of <laughs> um, So yeah, so these coordination pains are... Pro are are uh, present in uh, our societies because um, realistically, uh, I personally didn't have any experience in non-hierarchy until I was in my 20s. Uh, and still there was a bunch of relative hi hierarchy there. It's like my school was a hierarchy, my household was a hierarchy, my friend group had a hierarchy. Uh, and if we do also understand um, uh, that anyone who, for the last like couple thousand years, anyone who was interested in non-hierarchy was pretty much murdered. <laughs> it is a pretty extreme forcing function of society towards a certain type of organization that we have undergone collectively. Uh, and that trauma is embedded in our cultures and as a result, in fact, and our we borders, are really shitty. And our psyches. And our psyches and our bodies. And our language. And our language. Deep. And then as a result, it's really hard for us to coordinate in non-hierarchical ways. It makes Speaking sense. Speaking as two people who are actively trying to be non-hierarchical in a space that is non-hierarchical, but like neither of those things are true. <laughs> <laughs> right. But we're trying. But we're trying. Um, so I guess the question we have for you is, um, if without going maybe into the story, what are some of the things that you think could have helped with the coordination problems that you experienced in your relationship to volunteering or organization? Oh, 
we got a hand. I know this sounds kind of obvious, but like a, a common starting point for understanding how that system would even work. I think often you have Can to you say that one more time? Common a common starting point for an alternative, like trying, like nine times out of ten, it begins, okay, how do we want to have this discussion? Oh, we, sh we should have this discussion in a non-hierarchical form, and then you spend a good deal of energy just setting the platform to be able to have the discussion, which then creates, it's like, well, we wanted to go somewhere, and now we, you know, right. first we had to build the car, and then we could drive there. The yak shaving of community participation. What chat are we going to use? Riot? Is it going to oh be Zulip? Is it going to be Slack? Stop. Stop. Is it going to be <laughs> <laughs> trauma position? <laughs> what ply toilet paper are we going to buy? Three hours later. <laughs> no, that's that's a that's a very good way of putting it. Okay. Common starting point. Anything else? Um, one. I guess just the, the working group model is, you know, splitting up uh, tasks, roles, responsibilities over certain kinds of decisions and disseminating that into many smaller groups that then report back to the larger group. Mm. Um, so, for instance, uh, at Omni, we don't have to have discussions about, you know, what we're, what kind of uh, maintenance supplies we're going to buy. That's just kind of a collaboration building working group articulates needs, finance working group approves and makes the purchases, and it doesn't ever have to go to the, you know, larger delegates meeting. Like, these are small decisions that, you know, we don't need to pay stake over. Uh, so that's been helpful. Very clear shared values and goals. So for those of you caught Gabe's talk yesterday morning, um, and he was talking about wireless Toronto, um, he talked about how ideology gets people in the door, but then it's like the social and the fun that keeps lubricating the group. So let's not forget the fun part. Um, the, the political has to be fun, and whatever mm -hmm. you're doing fun has to be political. And um, yeah, let's, let's not think that, yeah, that, that only ideology will carry you through. That's been my experience too. Mm. It has, like connects to like what we've been thinking about with like pleasure activism. And, like right. needs to feel good because n otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because if fighting the state feels like living under the state, it's just a non-starter for me. <laughs> I just I just want to address the uh, ideology of getting people in the door and, and the fun keeping them there. I, I would wonder historically has that been the case in successful political movements like with uh, not that I you know support Soviet communism, but uh, you know with Lenin. Uh, do you think that Lenin and the other revolutionaries in Russia were uh, there for the fun? Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know what the. <laughs> I don't know. Have you seen Death of Stalin? I'm regretting this live stream question. <laughs> Was Lenin in it for fun? Uh, yeah. And I guess, I mean, Follow one thing. Follow us on Twitter. Does, so like the success, because they were able to take power, but were they successful, right? And I mean, maybe those are two different questions. And maybe like, maybe their ability to take power and focusing on power lost. Maybe if they had more fun doing it, they would have, they would have experienced the joy that can be human life and not, you know, done all the, you know, things. We're not getting into it. Um, okay. I think we're good there. Um, but yeah. this is, we got this some is good not ones. a, this is not an outcome oriented presentation. If you've no. noticed, I'm not trying to convince you of anything or to tell you how to do things. I would just hope that you ask yourselves questions while you're doing things. Um, one other thing, accountability to a historical injustice. Um, I'm gonna use the we, and if you don't agree, you can go fuck yourself. No, I'm just kidding, not that serious. You just um, don't have to <laughs> feel part but, of the we. But what I really mean is that, okay, one, we live in a society, specifically in North America, that was built on the fundamental genocide of people who already lived here. Uh, two, uh, also, uh, we trafficked a bunch of people across an ocean in order for free labor, in order to become one of the most economically powerful regions in the entire world. 
Uh, three, then we went around the world and made sure that we could extract resources from people to maintain that legitimacy that we currently use in all of our electronic devices. Shout out Coltan. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Everyone's four. Everyone's face is like, oh, no. <laughs> and four, uh, the uh, systemic oppression of non-male or cis people uh, is fundamental and foundational to the maintenance of state-based power in our society. Um, and so given all those realities... Ashoka, just answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> given all those realities, I think it's something that we have to be uh, accounting for in the ways that we articulate the we's and the commons and, and the, the community the community uh, as we talk about this. Um, and knowing that our barriers to access can be numerous because of the ways, like, fuck, I use so many words in this presentation that like a lot of people who probably didn't go to a certain level of education wouldn't understand. I mean, like, you're speaking English. Territories of geographies, epistemologies, ontologies. Technical terms. Technical terms, yet, but... acronyms. Like, there's like, we. In some ways, the popular education piece is really important for what we're trying to do. And so if we are seeking to be an organ in relationship with people, uh, trying to make that as much as possible a mutual relationship um, in that we are seeing each other in, in who we actually are rather than the conceptualizations and assumptions that we tend to place as humans on each other. Uh, and so asking the questions of like, how can I support what you are doing rather than do you wanna try this thing that I'm building? Anything. Right, I just lost what I was gonna say, but um, something that the two of us have found really, or speaking for myself, but like in our collective work, what we found really helpful has been um, continually talking to each other and to others about what we're doing in a way that's wholly honest about what it actually is, what its limitations are, um, and like critiquing it instead of, um, I think it's easy personally to put a marketing slant on things and if there's like a little like fuzzy portion instead of talking about the fact that it's fuzzy and maybe not well defined and confusing or uncertain to call it a feature of sorts, um, um, which may be like a reality in a lot of cases of like the like funding sources and like the economic context that we live in, but on, e even if it's like in private to talk about, to talk about things with like as much honesty as, as I can, feels good and usually is what reinvigorates me and makes me continue, continue to want to work on this, this work or this idea that's not necessarily like within the context of acceptable work. Yeah. Would you, would you feel like, does that resonate? Does that resonate with anyone else here? Ooh, got some resonance. Cool. <laughs> got some resonance. Um, also, one thing that you said, this notion of like the parts that are fuzzy, the parts that aren't defined are a project, I feel like are the parts that can be spaces for collaboration or inquiry. Um, it's like, oh, I don't actually know how I'm going to do this. What do you think? Like, what's your experience with this? What are the learnings that you have in your life that you can teach me or maybe I can teach you and we can have a conversation about it and like synergize a better outcome than I would have come up on my own? I think it's important like if you don't know, oh sorry. I, I, I also agree with that. I, I think that um, in terms like thinking more technically, I, I guess if, if your project is technical, I, I think taking the parts where you don't know what to do and um, turning them into a cleanly defined interface is really helpful like saying, here is, you know, if you're talking about systems or code or something, like here is where somebody else could do something. Um, and I'm going to make it as neat and clean as possible for them to build on it um, because I don't know what the right way to do is. And so I'm going to make it really, uh, my part of it really simple and let them do a more complicated part. Hmm. I like that. I like that a lot. And expanding on this, this notion of like platforms or projects as invitations um, and allowing figuring out like, what is the, your process for on-ramping on people? Um, how are you on-ramping people that aren't just like you? Um, and yeah. if you're not, like why not maybe? Or maybe you're okay with it, but you just gotta like ask yourself the question. Um, I can't be like, I'm helping all the people or I'm helping the community if the community is all six, three black dudes. You know what I'm saying? Like 
yes, that is a community, but like conceptualizing it as the community seems a little uh, fallacious. That reminds me of something People's Open said yesterday, and I'm going to botch this, so correct me, but um, I think what you said was you have like a name for your group and a name for your mesh network that are separate names. And it like organizational entity and then the network. Right, so organizational entity and then the network itself to like welcome other people so it doesn't necessarily even need to be under one organization. Because hmm. we all really like start, or we, I see a lot of people interested in starting things, myself included, and sometimes, sometimes you gotta merge or it's, it's helpful to merge. Hmm. And recognizing that money is not the only barrier, even though it is a significant one. Such, uh, is such a significant barrier. Such a significant barrier, but there are definite other ones. And some people that have really done uh, some great work about this, if you work in tech projects, are people like the uh, Equitable Internet Initiative out of Detroit, um, which is a part of allied media projects. And they have some really good principles to think about, and I highly recommend that you look them up. They're like this much humanity and education and like this much tech. Like it's, it's fascinating. Like as an example of not needing to start out as necessarily a subject matter expert to like get things done and build. They're an interesting case because they, they're building, they're literally building mesh networks by the community for the community for free um, and are on their way to becoming sustainable economically in a way that doesn't require um, collecting money from uh, some of their subscribers. subscribers. I think that's I what guess. they call them. They're really cool. Cool. And so in that context of uh, uh, like popular education and community engagement is like this UX question of having ethical strategies for varying levels of tech literacy. Like, do we want, is it, should we understand our tools and to what extent? Um, do you need to know what a transistor is and how it works and like what it looks like to be able to build a network or to use it? Like, no, um, maybe. But like I want to. But you want to. But like what power is provided by the relationship or difference in relationship and understanding how something works, right? When I think about, like when I get to the point of thinking about how I engage with my own technical capacity with other people, I want to basically transfer them as much knowledge as possible or offer them as much knowledge as possible so they can conceptualize their own solutions to their own problems. Uh, maybe they won't necessarily know how to build them, right? But like they at least can be like, oh yeah, I could use JavaScript for that or I could use like this routing protocol and just like understand conceptually how the tool can be applied in the same way that people now can be like, oh, that's a screw, I should probably use a screwdriver. Um, like, if we could get to that level of, of tech literacy, um, like, I don't know how, I don't know the first thing about making a screw in, like, a metallurgist situation, like, and the composition of metals that you need to have in order for a screw to have the, like, strength to not break, like, I know fuck all about that, right? But I definitely know what, like, drill bit to use with what screw. And so, like, if we can get to that level, how is it? how would it be possible for us to create um, the capacity for people to conceptualize their own futures and have this kind of like Zapatista, many worlds are possible feeling. And that's been an interesting journey on like the road of documentation for us. Yes. Because writing good documentation is really tricky. Um, also thought, oh, we got a thought or a question or a... Um, I just kind of wanted to pose a question and kind of ask about how like how everyone collectively thinks about this problem of like expertise and user experience as it relates to the division of labor. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you said something about generalism, generalist versus specialist yesterday. Oh yeah, I don't want to say it because I might want to do it. Okay, never mind. Um, we'll talk after. But yeah, no, that's a really good question. This this question of specialization, right? Um, so leaking a little bit of information. I work in a job that's completely valued by capital. Um, and Same. so I benefit uh, from the kind of systemic disenfranchisement of people who don't have the same skills as me. Um, and that creates kind of a tricky situation because, yeah, of course, like 
there has been the time and effort that I've invested to be technical, to have the technical capacity that I do. Um, and I don't want to necessarily diminish that and the realities of that. Um, and so that's where I like, it's the, it's, there's this, this like balance for me between that where it's like, so I think that that's where the difference is. So it's like, if you d weren't technical, say, say you weren't technical, uh, but you wanted to build a mesh network and I was a mesh networking engineer, you could be like, you know what? I live in this community that doesn't have access to the internet, right? And I've heard about this mesh networking thing and I think it's something that I can apply, right? Where you, and you could get to that point and then you could be like, can you help me? And I could be like, oh sweet, yeah, I can, this is like, this is probably the like type of antennas you should get. This is probably the equipment you should get. And I can offer those solutions, like inc those, that, that expertise incrementally. But it's the difference of you being like in a rural community or a community that's not served by a major provider and then me being like, hey, you need a mesh network. And I'm gonna build it for you. And I'm gonna build it for you. That actually reminds me a lot of, um, so we visited Detroit like a month ago. Um, and the way the Equitable Internet Initiative has set up that kind of structure is the people, at, it's the people not in, in charge isn't the right word, but the people stewarding the, the project are not necessarily technical by training, but they have um, a member who is not necessarily from their community who has a lot of technical knowledge, who has worked with them for like seven years to come up with like educational materials and documentation um, to spread that knowledge. Um, in a way where they're not reliant on this person's skills, though they have been incredibly helpful, which is a really, it, it's a, a beautiful like, way of, of, of solving that problem, I think. Mm -hmm. Do we have a hand over here? I just wanted to say something connected to what Zach said about division of labor and this discussion around technical literacy and expanding access and the extent to which that's possible. Um, I've been thinking about, uh, as we spend all of this time and energy thinking about decentralized applications um, and decentralized networks, um, I'm not sure if anyone in the room has ever worked in manufacturing, but I actually used to. Um, and so the computers that we use are this like pinnacle of infrastructure, the supply chain networks that are required, the factories that are required to create them. And it's been troubling to me and it's unresolved um, what it means to be trying to decentralize the things we do with those computers when the, the manufacturing of them is a massive centralized pipeline. And like rooted in exploitation and, oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. Where'd you get the copper from? No. <laughs> um, this is why we're not a outcomes-oriented presentation. <laughs> it's just more questions. Food for thought. Well, uh, uh, no, no, go ahead, but no. we should also keep moving. Yeah, we sorry, have, we've been talking for a long time. We've been talking for a long time, and we have several more slides. Um, okay. So this notion uh, that we want to introduce is this relationship between nodes to creating a network versus individuals to communities and how those are related, right? Does, does a bunch of nodes make a net mesh network? Nah. May, unless Maybe. there's some form of coordination to connect them, right? And so does a bunch of individuals make a community? Maybe not unless there's a, some form of coordination to connect them. And so this question of like, is it, effect, is it possible to effectively plan without a plan? Um, and can we use emergence as a possible strategy for transformation when there has to be a common language between the things that we're building? Any thoughts about that? And then I have something provocative to say. You have a question? Also, a nice shirt. Um, yeah, I like the statement of the question, like, is it possible to plan without a plan? I think, um, and 
talking about like what makes a mesh network and what makes a community as like analogous uh, ideas or questions as an interesting way of uh, stating it. I think part of uh, being a mesh network is that there isn't a uh, strict plan. There isn't some sort of pre predetermined, this is what the network's gonna look like, this is what it's gonna be. It, like, once we get this node here and we get that one there, then we can get internet to those people. And that's not really how you, uh, I, from working on it, it's not how you approach it. Uh, things come to you, you talk to people and you say, oh, yeah, you wanna be part of this? Awesome, like, get on the network, you know, become a node, become a, a community member. So it kind of happens, I like to think that it happens naturally, and that's part of what makes it a community, makes it a mesh network. So that's just my thoughts. Cool. Sweet. The other thing that I want to mention, we're moving faster than we'd like, but we'll send you questions if you want them, is this question of like the community as we conceptualize it as individuals. Uh, and I often hear it being used in a context where the individual saying it is not situating themselves in the com community that they're talking about. And so I, if for example, I'd be like, well, I'd be helping the community over there, but I'm not a part of it. And so the question I have for you, and I'd love if people answer honestly, is, is there, have there been instances where you've been able to measurably uh, affect a community that you are not a part of? In what, in what sense? In any sense. Yes. Tell us more. You also don't have to do anything you don't want to do. Well, it's... Well, because it's like it basically comes down to paid labor, right? Like if you're a part of, if you're working in community, like what's traditionally known as community work, or nonprofit or community organizations, you may not, you may like you're talking about this expertise. You may be in a person with a certain set of skills that you're trying to transfer to the community, and so therefore you're there engaging with it. You are a part of it while you are there, but the the the, the catch is you are only there because you are there part of paid for paid labor. Mm -hmm. If oh, that was not an option, you may not have actually ever engaged or been a part of the community. So are you actually a part, like while you're there as a laborer, you are a part of the community. Right. You are engaged with them, you are involved in the actual building of community over quote unquote there. But that doesn't, you're not really because it's pay, it, there's a financial burden how you perceive that right. is really kind of determines whether you are there or you are a part are the are the community. A question: Can I ask you a question? Sure. If you went back to that quote unquote community under the context of being unpaid, yeah. how would your relationship to them change? It doesn't change. It sounds like you're part of the community. To but me. I'm not. To me. <laughs> but but not. I'm not, though, because right. I'm not there. Like, it's like you're coming not, in and out. So there's a thereness that you're speaking well, to. Yeah, the, the, well, that's, that was part of the, sorry, that was the understanding of the uh -huh. question, because we uh -huh. kept saying, helping them, we were putting this right. thereness this, yeah. into it. So that's why, that, anyways. Cool. But that's the, yeah. Thanks for sharing. I have a, uh, I've got my own microphone, because I'm running the booth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow, look at that. Uh, I would suggest that anyone who has contributed to like an open source software project, if you put in those PRs on GitHub and or another Git related service, uh, to a piece of software or some sort of developed uh, item that you are not directly a part of normally, but you are contributing to a community and then maybe leaving it very fast, but putting in your part and t tools like Git make that very easy. And I think that that is a worthwhile example of what you describe. But if your commit is embedded into the software and your labor forever a part of that software, are you not a part of that community? Ooh. <laughs> we, got a, we got a plus back there. So, so you got here we got you got responsibility. There's a responsibility present in community. Oh, now it's getting like good. You have, 
paying your taxes. So technically, by paying your taxes. It's for the live stream. Oh, sorry. So technically, by like if you're part of a community and you're paying your like taxes, for instance, like taxes is just a, like if you're in the community and your organization taxes you in general because they have to pay for like roads or waterworks or hydro. Uh, technically, you're com you're contributing, or if they're doing like um, extended efforts somewhere else where you're, you may not be directly involved, but like by paying your taxes, because you you as a collective whole have decided that we're gonna like do this X, Y, and Z and have these expenditures. Technically, your taxation worked like that. Well, that's that's a governance <laughs> issue. That's not a taxation issue, right? Tax is just a tool, just like money is. So I'm I'm curious. Um, Go ahead. No, it's just value exchange, right? Um, and so if you as a collective whole, like you're, you would be contributing to a community that you may not be part of, but if you collectively were, um, if you wanted to say in an ideal world, were taxed properly, like how you say, like properly or ideally how you would think, you'd be contributing that way, wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, we're gonna move on though. Um, and I also wanna think about, is it possible to separate governance from the mechanism that governance is articulated through? Um, but we won't get into it because we don't have time. So, so we have like two, two things. So the dream is this question of interlocking local systems of sustenance. How might we blend local systems of mesh networking, food, water, and housing to our coherent future, our platform for the thriving of human society and civilization that is non-extractive and destructive to the other relationships we are embedded in. Um, and so one of the things that we also saw in places like Detroit or you can see in other systems around the world um, is the ways in which the places, like the place that has a mesh node also has like a solar panel and also has a community garden and also like a water filtration people uh, system. So how might we like create these interlocking systems when we think about how we're scaffolding network, mesh networks and then we like, oh, where are the energy systems that are for the community in this case? Where are the food systems for the community in this case? And build or augment the infrastructure that already exists to basically extend and make it more powerful. Um, one thing is in terms of coordination, funding, governance, blockchain, maybe. Uh, please keep listening. Wait, Sorry. please keep listening. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a token launch. This is not a token launch. Uh, <laughs> That should be the real, Plot twist, the real, ICO. this is that. And you can fund us by, no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> can you imagine? That'd be amazing. Um, <laughs> the most anti-pitch deck pitch deck. <laughs> um, okay, so this is something that we talk about, and this is our political bent, and this is the way we think about it, and we're building something called Distribute which is a method to fund, govern, and manage, and sustain the commons. Um, with like a really important caveat that you don't need to have money to participate. Like, like unlike so many, so many like blockchain systems, right. um, this was like our core thesis was like, how do you, like if you don't have money, like you can't be a part of any of these things. So really tried to focus on that with distribute. Yeah. And Working so on it with gas fees, but. And UX and all these tech literacy and pop educations and how do we onboard normal users to these new forms of systems and really answering these questions and trying to be accountable to them. Also, there's nothing at this URL yet, so. Yeah, yeah, that's not. But there will be soon. You definitely own it though, so don't try to squat it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to talk to us more about this, uh, we work for a monolith called Consensus. Uh, hey, live stream. Uh, and uh, and we, you can contact right. us if you want to. And for like, if you want to put us in a little box, you can put me in a little box. I write code, but I also do other things. So that's two little boxes. And you're fairly little. So you and can... I'm small. <laughs> <laughs> Three boxes. <laughs> All right. Anyway. I think that's it. Thanks. Thanks Thank for you. like bearing with us.